Also, we'll have live feeds. Thank you very much. Okay, so that's that's the announcement for the uh, for the Google Hangout uh, and the the live YouTube, and that that will keep running. And I'd like to welcome ah, rare, there we are. Um, all right, let's, let's, <laughs> there's Tolek. All right, um, and uh, just while he uh, picks up the uh, the call, because uh, Tolek actually came in on the Google, and. Um, there we go. So I'd like to start introducing everybody. Um, maybe I'll do it one by one this time. Um, and from uh, top left, as we are, as he comes on, uh, Tolek, good afternoon. Welcome to Ever Beyond. We're, we're live on the air. You can see who's on uh, on in the uh, the call here. And uh, good afternoon and welcome. Do you, do you want to sort of give yourself a little uh, a, a little intro or, or uh, a catch up on what you've been up to the last last few days? You're on the spot. <laughs> oh no, we got we got a call this user. Tolek. JP, this is Tolek. I'm Hi. In. Good afternoon. How are you? Hi there. I'm okay. You'll. I don't know what kind of noise you can hear in the background, but the internet at the uh, community I live in went down three days ago, and so I'm at a, uh, a Dunkin' Donuts down the street. It's the best I could get. Well done for Dunkin' Donuts. It's it's yes. all right. Have you got you have you got your headset and stuff? Uh, yeah, you I, can have hear us I have my uh, headset, microphone attached, uh, little foam mitten on the microphone, but there's still background music and noise. Oh, that's so, that's all right. It's not so bad. It's not so bad. And if you mute during during times when you're not not speaking, that'll be great. Okay. Um, so uh, everybody, if you can, if you ask Tolek like a question, uh, give a couple of seconds for him to uh, un unmute his mic to answer. So, uh, to oh. No, we've lost. <laughs> now we've lost Tole. We lost Simon. Um, so uh, further on down the road, <laughs> let's keep going. Win Keats, do you want to say hello? Hi, JP. Yes, I'm here, good and strong, and it's good to be back. And it's fantastic to be on the show with Alex again. Indeed. And Alex Collier. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, gentlemen. How are you? We're all good. How's How yourself? You? I am. I'm good. I'm good today. Thank you. So, um, <laughs> we've we've lost Simon. Um, I'm just going to try and bring you back into the call. Um, oh, here he comes. There we go. Uh, we'll see. Yeah. No, he's on the. All right. So Simon Simon's been hit with his microwave beams, and uh, I was hoping to ask him about Shungai, and we'll we'll see see how that is later. Uh, he really he really has been cooked. So I, I did a, um, uh, an EMF sweep of his house, and uh, the levels uh, in the room that he. Uh, uh, he calls from uh, are a hundred times the safe level. They really are beaming him. Me gosh, me gosh. So, um, uh, I mean, Alex doesn't really know uh, what what this was about, but basically, Alex uh, Simon Parks was being beamed at um, from a, a transmission tower very close to him. Wynn is an electromagnetic expert, and uh, he he took his meters round to his house. So uh, it's bizarre. It's, yeah, it's in a, yeah, it's in a band between his knee height and his head height uh, in his room only, and uh, very tight beam and very powerful. Wow. Uh, sounds like desperation. Yeah, yeah, and it's um, it, it can't be good for uh, good for him, and uh, obviously not very good for his electronics. Oh, no. <laughs> no, of course not. I'm sure it's affecting his body dramatically. Yes, uh, I'd, I'd seen um, a similar... Uh, effect on it with a friend of mine's house, but uh, at a level 20 times less than Simon's. And that was um, sufficiently powerful that it was re-radiating from all the metal objects in his house, including the, the radiators and even his metal bedstead. Uh, his metal bedstead was uh, emitting enough Wi-Fi uh, range frequency uh, equivalent to 100 Wi-Fi transmitters. And that's nowhere, near the, that's, that's nowhere near the strength of the signal that's going through Simon's uh, room. It's amazing. Good Lord. So let's yeah, well, we, yeah. Sorry, Alex, go ahead. I was just going to say we we need to do something to help them. Yeah, um, yeah. We've uh, we've identified where the signal is, so we can try to avoid it now. And uh, uh, and I'm quite adept at manufacturing industrial quantities of organite. <laughs> so uh, yeah, we're doing our best. And uh, excellent. And I think he's contacting the appropriate authorities to try and get them to stop radiating him. That's a good idea. Yeah, I would say. So, you know, um, just before we started the show, I, um, 
uh, Wynn was talking to me about the, the, the Lyran trauma, which is a, a, a video I did last week, um, which related memories that are coming up within me and feelings that are coming up with me, within me, uh, about what has happened over the last billion or so years. I don't even know the time scale. Now, I know that Moronet has spoken to you about, uh, some of this, Alex. Um, do you want, do you want to tell us a little bit about from, from the Moronet's perspective? And also, do the Andromedans originate in Lyra as well? Oh, okay. Well, I, I'm not sure what perspective you want regarding what. You didn't, I mean, if you're referring to Lemuria, which was the first thing you said, I don't really know that much about Lemuria. No, the reptilian attack on Lyra. Uh, Oh, that. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, and I, unfortunately, they do have a perspective on that. And yes, most of the human life, um, in, in our galaxy originated in Lyra. Uh, but it was brought to Lyra from other star systems, from other galaxies, rather. Okay. Human life did not originate in this galaxy. It came from other places. Um, and it's believed that a group of uh, very advanced beings known as the Founders, a.k.a. the Patal, were the ones to help seed the universe with different life forms. Um, and that would be all life forms. Now, from what I have been told, and um, this information, you know, isn't new. I've, I've shared it, I don't know, 25 years now. Uh they came across the Lyran star system, and they were very intrigued, the reptilians, uh, with the star system and the life that was there. So what they did was um, there was, there was uh, an attempted contact, and because of the difference in the way they looked and the difference uh, with the way they handled themselves, the difference with their ships, at, uh, as such, there was a misunderstanding. The Lyrans interpreted the uh, first contact as a threat, and they reacted as such. The reptilian races, however, did not make matters better at all either. Being an aggressive war race, um, instead of taking some steps back, they overreacted themselves and actually began attacking the outer uh, planets and moons that had small colonies on them first. And then what they did was they waited to see what kind of a reaction they would get from the larger planets. In other words, they were testing the defenses of the Lyrans. For the most part, the Lyrans themselves didn't have defenses. They didn't think they ever needed it. <laughs> Excuse me. They hadn't been threatened before, <laughs> excuse me, other than, um, you know, maybe rogue asteroids or comets or meteor showers, things of that nature, which are pretty, fairly common throughout the galaxy. Uh, and when they didn't get a response, the reptilians, when they did not, the draconians didn't get a response, uh, a military response, they became more and more emboldened. But they were still very careful, uh, but they did a systematic attack. Uh, at the same time, the Lyrans realized that they were in serious trouble, and what they began to do was to build arcs. And they had many ships at the time, but they're not ships that we would uh, understand as today. What they did was they had used moons and uh, very large asteroids they would hollow them out, and they would build the craft on the inside because they didn't have the raw materials to build the metal shielding and, and housing. So they would use, you know, what was available. And they began to migrate um, as the attacks became more and more systematic and, be, and began to come in deeper into the Lyran system. They decided that uh, we needed to get out and and – they got out as many as they could, uh, which is literally forced the migration and the eventual population of parts of the galaxy with human life. Um, 
it that's it, it literally forced the issue. So whether that was on purpose or not remains to be seen, but something extremely positive came out of it. And um, many of the different races that we have today, human races uh, of different color, um, of different genetic makeup, it was in fact, is in fact, the result uh, of that conflict uh, in the Lyran system. Thank you. Alex, <laughs> Alex, this is Tolak. How long ago? How long ago was this? We're, we're talking millions, as we would calculate time, millions of years? Yeah, in Earth years, we're yeah. probably talking about 630 million years is when it first started. Wow. Yeah, long time ago. But that's in Earth years. So, so here's, yeah. here's my point in this. Um, I think one of the problems that, that happened was that there was a, this first attack, um, you know, from the outside, it's destroying a planet. But from the Lyran's perspective, it was like cutting off their arm um, or, or some other very important body part uh, because it, it was because everybody was telepathically connected with each other. Uh, like when you see uh, in Star Wars and uh, Darth Vader destroys Algeron, you see, you see Princess Leia flinch like someone's punched her in the stomach. That's, that's, that's what it felt like. Uh, I would agree because everybody had a, everybody does in fact have a symbiotic relationship. And, um, when you're talking about a star system and everybody's in contact with each other, yes, there, there is a connection. Um, but it was more than just cutting off an arm. Uh, it, it began, it turned into an extermination. Um, and everybody knew it. So, which is why they bailed. They left. Um, they were not in a position, they, they weren't used to thinking defensively. They were not, their scientists were dealing with healing arts, healing sciences, uh, environmental sciences, um, things that the sciences were, their focus was on making their, their civilization flourish um, and more healthy and more spiritual and more evolved. So this, this, they were on the right side of the tracks where the reptilian races, though they could move to the right, they were predominantly on the left. Um, their whole deal turned into a control issue and, um, they, uh, they didn't look back. They didn't look back. Thank you. That's how it's been, that's how it's been explained to me. Uh, for that whole conflict. Um, and there has been this attitude regarding humans ever since, a disdain, a disrespect that, um, that we're weak, that we're not strong, that uh, we are a weaker race, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, of course, all of that is a fallacy, um, but it's just a... Um, it's just a mindset, you know. It's just a mindset. So they have a lot of the same issues we do. Uh, I see. I, I, I very much agree with this. And what, what I'm discovering is that all of these races have a trauma that informs their behavior. That then they go out and they, then they express that trauma onto others. Uh, and to, uh, like some, you know, I was looking at the Lyran Trum and now, now I'm, I'm looking at the other perspective of, of the reptilians and why were they such badass? And their well, you know, feeling they were, of being they were abandoned. Here. Yeah, so you, you well, were saying. They were, they were brought here from somewhere else and it could be that the history of their, um, their archetype, uh, which we don't know, I certainly don't know. The A's don't exactly know their entire history, where they came from. Uh, but that's probably what happens. Maybe they were brought here to be given a chance to um, heal, and it just didn't happen. I don't know. Um, but there was a lot of projection of whatever happened before, they projected on everyone here. So... Yeah, my understanding, Alex, is I, I came in rather later. I came in about 120 million years ago. 
And my understanding from that perspective then was that we believe the reptilian race had been genetically engineered, brought through from another universe, and they were also uh, AI nanobot augmented. They were designed as a, a warrior caste by another species. And right. we, we, we had no contact or knowledge of that species that created them, but uh, they certainly carried that perspective forwards. There are races that the A's talk to that share that opinion. Yeah, that's pretty yeah. much my memory. Yeah, my, the, the other information I, I had from that time was that the, uh, the founder race you were talking about, that uh, approximately 5,000 of them um, effectively crash-landed on the planet we're on now approximately 500 million years ago, so in, in the middle of this time scale, um, where most of them died, but some of them actually did reconfigure themselves to live here in a very primitive form, but that became part of the uh, Simeon line, and they conveyed the metagene they brought with them to the Simeon line, which became hybridized with the humans here on Earth later on. Oh, my God. <laughs> Does that mean that the RH positives have that metagene bloodline? Yes. Boom. Thank you. I am going to be speaking with the aforementioned Eva Semenova. She's the one who brought this information in. Ah, I may... yes, I, yes I've, I've heard Eva talking about it. She's the only person I've heard talking yes. about that information correctly. She's very, very quietly spoken. She's got a really heavy accent, and I'm going to very gently talk with her, and we're going to tell this story as well. So thanks for bringing that one up, to Win, because that's the, it's, there's so many people from so many different streams all here at the same time and another thing that i i wanted to sort of have as a seed topic is the time of the crossing we are here at the time of the crossing so um now uh someone who hasn't spoken yet uh who <laughs> is getting is on a really patchy internet so we've got to make the most of when when you're on simon good afternoon simon parks hello jp yes it's the usual story isn't it i i've the calls dropped five times since I've been on, so pretty poor. Uh, I'll just say a little bit before I get cut off again. Well, look, when you get cut off, just pick up your blow. We'll pick you up, okay? Yeah, okay, probably the best bet. Uh, just, just uh, obviously, I only picked up a few bits and pieces there, but when um, it's interesting when a a soul is incarnating or intends to incarnate on Earth, and they're coming from the Lyran system. Uh, they will go to the Palladians for training. Uh, they'll incarnate into a Palladian body first because they need to understand uh, how to survive um, and to be strong. But some of the, and, and this isn't meant rudely at all, some of the Palladians are quite um, arrogant. Uh, yes, Simon. Uh, I mean, obviously in the, in the uh, events after the Lyran conflict, uh, the, at one point the Palladians were becoming the dragons we were fighting. <clears throat> exactly, exactly. I think we lost time again. <laughs> that was, that was okay. Him. Well, there's, there's a, Alex. yeah, he refers to uh, an arrogant bunch, and um, that is the mindset of a of a specific group uh, in out of Aldebaran. They're they're a pretty rough bunch, yeah. and uh, they're definitely rough around the edges, and uh, they they have a they have a very strong opinion about how they think should things should be. And in, in many places, it's their way or the highway. So, oh, I'm back now. <laughs> <laughs> welcome, welcome back again. All right. Yeah. yeah so the other bit I want the only other bit I wanted to say before I get cut off yet again um, about the. Um, I think it, for me it's very important. The well, I think I heard Wynn talking about what we call the founders. Uh, see, they contain twelve strands of DNA. And that's, that's so important because that is what the reptilians were after. Um, and the little bit I know uh, was that the com onboard computer of the craft attempted to um, reconfigure everything down to a sort of a 3D format. Um, and most of the crew or passengers were lost because it's such a huge jump to go from 12th dimension down down to third but that that was originally arriving here with with the 12 strands of dna which the reptilian task force tricked the people to lose so um from the little bits right. i did pick up that, that's what i heard so it was this is really good stuff 
Yes, indeed. This, this is a really, really important story because this, this is our true history, yes. uh, that which has been denied to us and that we've also <laughs> forgotten due to this trauma. And, uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's been a, a very long, strange journey uh, personally for me to, to, uh, to arrive here to discuss this with you guys at this time. And I'm sure we've all had, you know, we've all <laughs> got stories of strange journeys, yeah. Uh, and everybody who's listening as well. So here we are. What do we do with this moment, brothers? Well, I, I think we plot a, I think we plot a positive course forwards and we make the planet the way it should be. And I think we return to living with our hearts. Well, yes, I, I would have to agree with when, you know, first we need to decide. Um, what is it that we want? And, you know, symbiotically, if we're all thinking we want something better and positive, um, we will begin to, to create that and begin to manifest it physically. But we have to get into that place. And in order to be able to get into that place of, of creating something positive, we have got to see what fear is for what it really is. We have got to see what the regressives are and how they operate strictly out of a place of fear. We need to absolutely identify what the issues are that hold us back and then know how to deal with it, how to confront it, as opposed to allowing ourselves to move into that fear and not remain the, the observers or, in fact, the creators of our future. As long as we allow others to make decisions for us, they're going to create a reality that we are going to manifest physically because we're the creators. They're just leading, they're, they're just driving the cart, you know. Um, but it, it's not working out for us. It, it really isn't. Uh, because I don't know many beings that are truly, truly happy with the direction things are going on this planet. Um, and if things were going that well, we would not have the armadas of benevolent forces in our solar system. So clearly things are not going well. They're going awry. And, um, yeah, I mean, we've, 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 it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. Yeah. The, Alex, uh, the, this is to- oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say that the Art. thing I've noticed that increasing is that people are actually, their cellular memories are waking up now. I mean, you've just had it, JP. I've had it for some time. Holy crap, yeah. Yeah, and, and I think this is a process that's spreading around humanity. And I think once we remember who we are and we remember how it could be, I think that's going to be a very positive force for helping project that as a creational energy forwards. Right. When I, I, this is totally like I happen to agree. Uh, Alex, when you're saying us and we, I take it that you're talk, talking about we as the diverse group of human beings on this planet collectively as a global society. But in fact, we have all of these different cultures and races that are occupying this planet. And un- unfortunately, we have, you know, the, the minions or the lieutenants, if you will, of the reptilians who are still in control, who are leaving these large fear breadcrumbs, if you will, you know, called terror attacks, bombing attacks. And they're all they're all, let me try this again. They may not all be triggered, planned, uh, psyops, uh, special forces guys, uh, but I would say that likely a lot of these people are triggered and programmed. And it, it guys, jump in if, uh, if, if you'd like to. I, I believe that, you know, upwards of, 20 years ago, we had maybe one or two events like this. And I think it started with um, the high school kids, or sorry, the grammar school kids, Columbine, Colorado, mm-hmm. and Oklahoma City, and, you know, the list goes on and on. I, I saw a number recently that indicated that we've had like 20 plus some odd shootings, bombings, killings on, on a mass scale, 20 plus in about a year and a half unprecedented off the charts. And I'm bringing this up because there are so many people that emotionally dive into the, oh, this is tragic, this is so sad. Well, yes, it's tragic and sad, but they're not asking, 
why are these kinds of events happening? They immediately go into, and I, you know, I, I get out, I get out in public, so I hear people what people are saying. And what they're talking about is, oh, well, you know, we got a race problem, and oh, the poor police, the poor police, you know, the police are here to defend our society. And it's all, it's all, look over here, you know, look to the left. When the issues are really right in front of us, there's a group of people that is in the remaining power vacuum that's doing whatever they can to keep people in fear. You know, referring back to your, your comment, Alex, and the more fear that they can generate and perpetuate, the more that this remaining dark group that works in the shadows up at the top can, can, can control different different populations. And that's why we're seeing these things happen in Europe, here now in the States, in Africa. I, it's almost global. Yeah, I'm not talking about wars. I'm not talking about wars. I'm talking about, you know, what are called terrorist attacks or, or bombings or mass shootings. Wynn, go ahead. I think yeah, I think you. what is very telling, which uh, shows really who's behind this, is that uh, the, they're just doing more of the same. They have very little imagination, if any. Uh, and I think that's a very big indicator as to what this really is. It's just more of the same. Right. But it's almost um, scripted. It's like whenever there's a moment of quiet and peace and silence, then they, they trigger another one. Well, it, it, they're doing it on purpose. You, you go from being calm to going right. to extreme fear. They, 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 they like to swing the emotions from one extreme to the other. Now, when you say persons, let me just clarify this, that this group that we're referring to are beings. Some of them are human. Many of them are not. Okay. Right. But you got to understand that we are a collection of 22 different races, our DNA, okay? And, and folks, this is just what it is. We are, we are a Heinz 22. We have all these different races, and if we leap from third density to fifth density, which is apparently our destiny, we change everything. We change all of these races because the energy that will come from through us will go back to the home worlds. There is no way to stop that because it's a symbiotic relationship. And they're terrified the the, the beings who are know that are running this planet who see this holographically, they are terrorized because they will be completely isolated and then they'll they're done. And then they're done. They will just literally implode on themselves because they cannot hold this frequency. No. So they, it's, they not it's, only can't it's, hold it, they can't tolerate it. As they, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, they can't. So it's, it's, um, it's remarkable. We are so more powerful than we realize. And there's so much more to us than we realize. Which is why everybody's here to try to help us. It's just, you know, we have to step up. We have got to step up. And I've been saying this for months. We have to start thinking differently about our environment, about our planet, about our creation. We have to start thinking differently about ourselves and all of this race war. This is all, it's all Bravo Sierra. What they're trying to do is keep us divided because that keeps them in power. That's yeah. right. <clears throat> all right, guys, you take over. And, and yeah, and uh, uh, Tolik again, and I'll be brief. Uh, without interjecting any ego into this, and I mean this sincerely, um, we are doing something about this. The, in this case, the collective we is those of us who are openly discussing this on what is a non-commercial, sorry, a non-commercial radio format. But there's only so far a small percentage of the whole global population that's listening to us. Um, so we are, um, you know, if you if you will, the vanguard of change. We're the vanguard of positive change by providing realistic, if you will, real time information about what's really going on. Now, if you will, we're doing our jobs, if that's the way we see it. Now it's up to the people out there listening in internet land, if you will to do their job and listen, if they so choose. But, you know, Alex, like you've identified 
many times, each of us are sovereign individuals, and we have the right to free will choice. And it is certainly a, a question in terms of how many of the people on this planet are going to choose to evolve in part of that well, higher dimension shift. We don't need everybody. <laughs> we don't true. need everybody That's to get true. it. We, we don't. So we just don't. Um, you know, very, very soon there's going to be some event, and it's probably going to be, I'm not sure if it's going to be Nibiru or if it's going to be a worldwide sighting of a, a fleet of starships, but there's going to be an event that is going to shift everyone's perspective. And it'll be from there that this, what we're talking about, these things that we're talking about is really going to make huge leaps and bounds. Um, it's, it's coming. It's inevitable. I just don't know what it looks like yet. Um, so it'll kind of go from, you know, the quiet chat rooms to public, you know, vocal public discussion, serious, yes, serious yes. discussion, debate about all of these things that we open, it, openly it, talk about. It, exactly. It, exactly. I mean, just think about um, the whole world seeing starships. We're automatically going to know we're not alone. That shifts the conversation forever. It does, you know, and uh, and then we'll all be on the same page. And it really won't matter who's in the ships, okay? What's really going to matter is the fact that now the conversation's changed and we all begin to see ourselves differently. So that's huge. That leap by itself would literally keep the genie out of the bottle forever. Yeah, when people start asking, well, who are they? So those of us are going to say, well, which who? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> which ones? <laughs> Here's our list. You know, it's like, Here's the menu. Which right. ones do you want to talk about? <laughs> which now? Which dimensions? Dimensions? You know, I can imagine those first first set of conversations. They're going to be some people picking up phones, calling some of us. <laughs> well, yeah, that, that, that's true. But at the same time, you know, the conversation can be, well, I wonder what they think of us, and we can really seriously begin to look at ourselves. Because now we know that another perspective exists, and they're not us. And they will have a perspective about how we treat each other, how we live, what we're doing to our environment. We can seriously begin to have that conversation because we know another perspective exists. And, um, you know, that takes, that takes everything to a whole new level. It certainly does. And this, Alex, is exactly the reason why we have you here. Because, you know, out of, out of anybody, <laughs> anybody that we know, you, you were the first person, uh, to describe that exact event of, of learning something from a new perspective and how much of a shock it was for you personally. Uh, I'm, I'm still not right. <laughs> still reading, yeah. Exactly. And you, it, it won't stop until you've told all the stories, you see? That's how you, that's why, you know, that's why you need us <laughs> and why we need you. Man, I'm not touching that one. <laughs> I appreciate that. I do, really. <laughs> yeah, if, if I may, I'd like to, this is Tolak again, um, just briefly, I'd like to make a point. I was, uh, out here in the world working a few days ago and as, as, as I, as I said to Simon, I was, uh, ousted from my community simply because the uh, our internet went down three or four days, three days ago, courtesy of Comcast. It's not working. So I've been in, working in the local Dunkin' Donuts and have heard... You're, you're a, a data a refugee. Couple, yes, yes. A couple of new shooting events. Um, one happened in the States, and this is like within four days. One happened within the States, and one recently uh, happened in Germany. And at the, the one... And, and there... This Duncan Notes was half full of people, and they were all looking up at the CNN screen, which is playing the story over and over and over and over again. And I had the thought. It was one of those deep, intu intuitive knowings. I'm like, this game is almost over. Why? Because we are now, and now I'm going to, if you will, in invoke um, – uh, she's still alive, so it's not the memory, but I'll invoke the words of Carol Rosin. There will be five cards that will be played. Right now, we're almost at the peak of the terrorism card, the, the, the global powers, the one that operate in the dark, the shadow beings, if you will. 
they're almost they're almost at the peak of the terrorism card. The next card they're going to try to play is the the open invasion, false flag. They're here. That's that's the point when the whole thing's going to start to fall into place, if you will, and cascade. That will actually be the beginning of the end when that that first false flag is announced. Because I can almost guarantee <laughs> all of you and everybody else out there that we won't be hearing about, if you will, the benevolent, the good guy ETs first. The powers that be are going to announce somebody, likely the reptilians or some hybrid version of theirs, that have been here on planet for a long time. And they'll trot them out, and they'll look human, but they'll, they'll like be, likely be hybrids. They'll promise a lot of things they'll never deliver on. Thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, so can I quickly quickly yeah. come in? Um, first of all, um, and I think many of us will know this, that uh, the major governments have been sort of asked to declare the truth and have reneged on it. <clears throat> and it's now to the position where they've all been given an ultimatum to bring forth disclosure. And if they don't, then disclosure will be brought forward without their say-so. The difference there is that if the Earth governments uh, controlled disclosure, then they can manage the situation. If it's taken out of their hands, they can't. So that's the first thing. The second thing I want to say is that um, the false flag is a very real option because if uh, benevolent um, off-planet entities are going to disclose, then what the uh, elite on the planet will try and do is get in just a few hours before Work. with the, the, the false flag and they will use um, robotic greys which they have in some underground facilities they will use the first generation of triangle craft and they will have mock-up scenes of combat between American soldiers and these, these, these aliens um, the difficulty for them is that Putin in Russia is not going to play that game. Uh, the original plan was that the major countries of the world would all uh, agree to that. But there are major countries now that are not going to play the game. So it's going to basically be America uh, and Britain following suit and perhaps Australia and Canada. So it's not going to be uh, the, 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 the easy program that these psychopaths no. had actually planned for. And the other thing I, I will say is that um, we haven't talked about a potential economic uh, blip occurring. That also is programmed to come in as well. And Tolex points, sadly, is accurate, that so many people don't seem to um, see the truth. They don't seem to be able to respond. But, you know, when all the cash machines turn themselves off and the banks close their doors when there are um, disruptions to communications people I hope will not just look around and uh, and say what's going on I hope they'll say what sort of life have I got what sort of person am I uh, is this the right way to elect my leaders uh, are my values right now I'm hoping that everything will change that people will begin to question their whole way of living, the whole way that the, the system works. Um, and then, you know, our job, those that, and our job meaning those people who are awake, is to support those people who, who feel their world has collapsed. They will feel that, how could I have been so stupid? How could I have believed all these lies? Their, their whole world will have totally gone, and they're very vulnerable. That is an incredibly dangerous position for us because if we have a vacuum some other entity or some evil person might attempt to try and get in there and to form an alternative government so i see the job of all of us who who have been brave enough to come forward and speak to support people to get on the strength to look inside themselves to find that energy to believe in the better and to believe in themselves and to resist any strong arm tactics from anybody who's going to try and force their will uh, onto a, an emerging new humanity. And just finally, I do do agree with Alex. Um, this world, this third dimensional planet, has been so modelled on the fourth mm. dimension. 
we don't need to go through it very much. You know, on this planet we have words, uh, Satanism, uh, occult, sacrifice, uh, all of these words, black magic. Now those words don't exist in the fourth dimension, but their energy does. And it was the energy from the fourth dimension that was drawn here that's created that. So we, we don't need to go to the fourth and stay there because we've already experienced it. We need to just pass through it very quickly and go into the fifth where those words and that energy holds no strength because the vibrational uh, force of the fifth and higher is such that there is no place for those uh, resonation of energies that cannot cannot survive there. So actually, I'm very positive for the future. I actually think we're going to make it. I think it's going to be a bumpy ride, but I'm very positive. So, th so that's my two penneth worth. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, it's not, it's not going to be a, a clean, smooth transition. It'll be somewhat messy. Uh, yes, it is. <laughs> yes, it is. But, um, but, you know, the lessons learned, the lessons learned will be invaluable when we begin to help other races um, that begin similar trials. Simon, you referred to a um, uh, to a scenario where there is a vacuum. That would be the place where they would bring in a false messiah and, um, you know, continue that that nonsense. Um, but, uh, you know, their nonsense of getting everyone to comply and, and take a mark and, and yada, yada, yada. Uh, but, you know, our, our roles will be to not only, uh, give clarity to what's happening, but also to try to help people get back up because many of them are going to be floored when they realize that they have invested 20, 30, 60, 70 years of their life in belief systems that are absolutely Bravo Sierra, that they have built their life and their personalities and, and their perspectives uh, all based on many false premises. Um, and, you know, our job is to just say, look, it's going to be okay. This is what it is. You know, we need to move forward and to encourage people to get back up and start moving forward and to join humanity and to have hope with humanity to continue to build and create our future. We we have to do this. We have to create our own future. No one else can do this. We we can't we can never ever surrender our ability to create our future to anyone. And and the uh, Alex the the false savior may even be introduced as a false savior race. You know, here are the, you know, invent a name. And, oh, we're, we're here to help you. We're going to give you all of this technology. Just trust us. Things will be fine. Of course, part of the false flag. And the, whoever they is that will be introduced, they'll never deliver on what they're promising. But Well, they're, you know, that's not their intention. Their intention is control. That's right. Yeah. It's yeah. Cheap. Sheeps to slaughter, and the idea for them is, listen, we know we're not going to be around much longer. We're going to take as many of them as we can possible. And, and, I, I and, just, and you know, and, and, and folks listening, you know, the reason our race is being zeroed primarily in, at this moment is because we have this vast um, pool of genetics that are off-world, 22 different races, Many of them are incredible races, okay? And that's why we're being zeroed is because we are so unique that we literally are a game changer. We are. We're a game changer. We can change the game. If we ever truly get on our feet and join as one humanity, we can change the game forever. And, you know, that would be something to see. I hope to be around to see that, frankly. Yeah, I, th I think we will be. I, humanity has the ability to imagine and create like no other species I'm, I've ever come across. We can make this world and other worlds exactly how we want to be. We just have to want to do it. 
Now, uh, you know, a lot of people talk about that um, and say, you know, we can we can do this and we can, but it's like there a lot of people feel that there's a kind of disconnect between somebody saying, yeah, we have all these infinite powers and actually expressing those infinite powers on an everyday basis. You know, well, it's because we don't we don't have a clarity of being. That's why. I mean, this is my opinion. We do not have a clarity of being. We are not really clear about who we are as a race. And we are definitely not clear who we are as individuals and spiritual beings. Many people are not clear about that, you know, sure. and when you make a leap like this, you've got to have that clarity. You have to know what you know so that when you make these decisions, you don't look back. You don't start questioning yourself because when you start questioning yourself, you start to delete and dissipate the energy, the focus. And remember, energy flows where focus goes. So, you know, we're waiting for that last piece, that last domino to fall into place, and that's clarity of being. Yes, uh, yes, the way I'd seen the process working, I was, I was, I was taken and shown it was that it operates through consensus will, because at the superconscious level, we're all one conscious entity. And it's the combined will of all of us that determines which of the quantum probabilities of the reality we experience next. It, it, I was shown it, it was like a, it was like a disc of light on a, on a, uh, like a stretched table with a speckled pattern on, which was the uh, potential of all possibilities in our universe. It's just our universe at that dimensional level. But when you get to the closer level and you look at the edge, the, the disc is actually breathing, it's moving, it's testing and tasting all the quantum probabilities and then deciding which of those stepping stones of quantum probability to go to next. And the scary thing is, it's it's the consensus will. So you can have somebody who has clarity and strong willpower, but if they're one of six billion people and the other six billion people have no clarity and no control and vision but are manipulated by and synchronized by things like television, then then they s simply will make the wrong decisions instead of the the more spiritually uh, uh, exciting ones. Yes, and but, but what I did see from that experience was that actually we are almost infinitely connected to all the probabilities in the universe. So we can change reality in any direction we want to and make literally anything we want to. We only have to decide through consensus will that that's what we want to do, and then we'll do it. We'll just go in that direction. Wynn, I'm so glad you're on the call. <laughs> I really am. Yeah, just brilliant. Just brilliant. The way you explain that. Thank you. Oh, my, my pleasure. It was, uh, it was a very interesting experience, to say the least, when I, when I was shown that. And I, and I don't know how otherwise to describe it, because it was, wasn't strictly in this dimensional state that I experienced it. But yeah, that, that's kind of how it seemed to work. Yeah, uh, as, as a, a way to look at uh, an Earth expressed experience, Simon, you, reached out to a group of people. I don't remember what the exact date was, but at the moment they were going to attempt to trigger the CERN Haldron Collider. And if I, I may not be t t telling this correctly, but you reached out to a group of people and said, let's bring our consciousness together and evoke change so that this doesn't turn out the way they want it. And... Some things, some positive things really came out of that. So my first question is, how long did it take to get all those people together? And, and through your efforts, how many people did come together? Do you ever, did, did you ever get a sense for how many con yes, consciousnesses? Uh, form, <laughs> yeah, I formed a group, and I have a group, which uh, we call Connecting Consciousness. And at the moment, I have 4,500 members there you uh, go. through mostly the English-speaking world but not exclusively so. I have each, I have an, uh, an overall United States coordinator and each American state now has its own connecting consciousness coordinator and he or she coordinates the connecting consciousness in that American state and that feeds back then to my overall US coordinator. I have a e European coordinator, she's based in Germany and she coordinates the, the European group, and I have one in England, Great Britain, and he coordinates Great Britain. Um, and the, the point with the 
uh, CERN uh, was that uh, it was protected by remote viewers and we had to produce a number of um, um, false attempts on it to draw away uh, their interest so that our, our number one man could do what he needed to do. And what is lovely is that the planet herself came to our aid and we've yeah. got screenshots showing that an electrical storm occurred and knocked out uh, the main generator that powered CERN. So um, we've got another one coming up. There's an attempt to activate the San Andreas Fault uh, in September. Um, and we're going to, we can't affect the machine because the machine is not sentient. You see, the, the, the Hadron Collider is a sentient machine. Um, but the, the heart, heart machine is not sentient. But as I as explained on one of JP's shows, there are three people who are responsible for making decisions on the harp. Two of them want to activate the device before the presidential election in November, and the other one wants to do it after the election, and they are at loggerheads at the moment. So what we're going to do is use, use the Connecting Consciousness group to remind these people that they are part of the human race, because they, they are humans, they're not aliens, uh, and that they need to understand that they have to make a decision as to which side of the fence they're on. So I, I, I don't have bank managers, I don't have office blocks, because all of that can be taken down. I just formed a connecting consciousness on the goodwill of ordinary people throughout the planet who wanted to do something positive. Uh, and because it's individual people, it can't be destroyed, it can't be taken down. And I, and I look at people, you know, like Dr. Stephen Greer and, and David Icke, and they went down the material route, uh, television studios, films, office blocks, uh, accountants, advisors. Well, the system, as it stands at the moment, protects itself. If you, if you try to use the system to change the system, then the system oh. will attack you. So I've not gone for the traditional method. Mm. I've gone just for the goodwill of people. Mm -hmm. um, so we're having some success, and, and I am just playing my small part uh, when everyone else is playing a part. And I reckon if we all work together, we can make it work. So that's, that's how I think anyway. Yeah. And I, I, I raised, I raised this matter because Wynn was talking about something that he saw from an internet, interdimensional perspective. And here you were able to do it with individual people, creating a collective consciousness to create change. And in fact, evoke change. And it not only evoked change, but it brought in Gaia, yep. you know, like Inamaka, as part of the process. Yes. So, it, I know, um, Alex, things can change when people do come together, as evidenced by Simon's view. I know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm just, <laughs> I, I'm just trying to say, well, okay, people, it may not be obvious, but here's an instance of how positive change can happen. Here's an illustration. Exactly. So uh, I'm going to manifest a little break for everybody because uh, probably bladders are full by now and there's a little bit of tension going on. Um, so uh, I'm going to play. Bladder, bladder tension. <laughs> Lots of bladder tension. In, okay. Inner tension. You know, so we have to set our inner tensions right. So uh, I'm going to play. A, I don't know if you've, you guys have ever heard of this band called uh, Zero Seven um, from their album Simple Things. And this is called uh, After Nibiru, Red Dust. <laughs> oh, God. Everybody, welcome back to the Ultra Galactic Roundtable version 3, volume 3, episode 3. With tonight, Tolek, Simon Parks, Winkeach, Alex Collier on the mobile. So, here we are. Um, there was zero seven and red dust. Did you enjoy that groove there? Yeah, it was good. Yeah, it was good. Very I was getting there. Yeah, very <laughs> pleasant, pleasant bit of music. Right? Uh, um, so, uh, where shall we? Um, where should we? Uh, where did we leave off? By the way, we kind of came came to some sort of level. Well, we were talking about how we can create a, an intent for a more positive, positive future. All right. That's right. So, I mean, here's one of the things. Um, Many people talk about, and this is these are the the worries that I've been through as well in my life, um, and that is worrying about money and worrying about love. 
You know, there's never, there, and this is the whole reptilian matrix. That's what it's about, is, is making that a completely restricted thing. Whereas what we're used to, <laughs> what everybody else is used to everywhere else in the galaxy, is there's a plenty of love and there's no money. Um, and right. so this is the reprogramming that we're going to need to get used to, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's never a shortage of love. Because if you project it and create it, it's always there. And as the Russian uh, proverb says, uh, if we could eat money, nobody would ever starve. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> <laughs> they just keep printing some more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what needs oh, to be, uh, what needs to happen is people need to get back to a real value and understand how money came about, what it was actually for, and taking the good parts of that and putting it into a different context so that it can be back in the control of, of the people of the planet to use as a method for running the planet more efficiently themselves and taking that power back from the people who've tried to focus that control into a tiny number of uh, uh, families and people. Which have hijacked the planet. <laughs> yeah, exactly what they've done. Uh, they've, they've spent quite a while doing it. But uh, it's very tenuous, and I, I think the awakening that's going on with people and this, certainly the cellular memory awakening that's happening that I'm... Uh, a lot of people are uh, coming to me uh, about now because they're suddenly shocked that they, these memories are suddenly uh, appearing and it seems to be spreading like a ripple. I think when people realize who they are and actually take a look around and see the way the place is being run, then they will, it will simply change. People will make an act of will and want it to change, and it will. Huh. I have a question for Simon, if it's if it's okay, kind of change the subject for a minute. I, I welcome this uh, event, please. <laughs> hey, Simon, your Cassiopeian friends, as we cross the galactic plane and we move through all this plasma, uh, and we start moving into fifth density, is their physical structure going to adapt, or do they have to leave, and or are they going to... Um, ride this through with us the the reptilians wanted to um ascend by proxy which is never going to happen in other words no the, the reptilians wanted to no. use the blast of energy that the humans were going to produce and then try to get themselves out of their trap but that won't work because their intent is incorrect and they don't have any love and the planet won't have that but the uh, the mantis um, who have a, have a gen, uh, genuine connection to the planet have also um, played a double game with the reptilians and we can talk quite openly about that this now we couldn't perhaps two years ago um, and uh, it is my belief that a large faction of the mantis uh, will uh, be accepted uh, by the planet and by the intent and by divine source, and will actually uh, rise up out of their own trap. But they are willing to evolve, and they're willing to change, and so they, they will actually make that, that change through. And that's what they've been working to, and that's why they did not go down some of the routes that the... Um, the reptilian draconis races went through. So um, they are ready to make the change. They've made the, I don't like the word sacrifice, but they've made changes within their own uh, structure, within their own way of dealing. Not all of them are going to make it, um, just as on the human race. But right. you know what? It's maybe just, just a small percentage is required to, to take that forward. So the answer... I think is a positive one, positive because they um, have long since planned for this, long since realised that they were going nowhere themselves and that uh, it's no good laughing at the human race and saying, look how primitive you are, because that very primitive uh, energy is a creational force. That That's the very thing that keeps the human race special. And so, yeah... I think they'll 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 yes. they'll be they'll be they'll be along for the ride. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's the right answer. <laughs> Jolly good. Uh, Simon, are there any uh, mantids that are uh, in in this time space on this planet presently? 
Uh, they don't. They don't do what the reptilians do. Um, they don't have permanent bases here. Okay. Uh, they they tend to come in, do what they need to do, and go. They do have temporary um, situations, but they don't have permanent bases. No, no, it's not their way. Okay. It's certainly going to be a very interesting situation when that moment, that first moment occurs when the vibrational frequency of this world shifts so significantly, so significantly that people all and all of us today are 3D organic humans, at least in physicality. That first moment when we start resonating at a higher rate and our forthcoming fourth dimensional and fifth dimensional eyes start to see all the other beings around us that have been here for a while that we couldn't see before. Yeah, I've, I've actually met people this has happened to in advance and um, they're quite shocked. Uh, people who had simply evolved to a higher spiritual frequency and had no interest in, uh, in the material we're talking about at all, but suddenly started to perceive and experience uh, the these other levels of uh, reality and, and different species, mm. and they, they they were initially quite shocked, and uh, yeah, uh, yeah, and that that's how uh, that's how I became involved because I was one of the few people that anybody could think of who might be able to give them a perspective on these things. So yes, I've seen this process, and, and it seems to be increasingly happening. And certainly since the, uh, the the consciousness frequency of the planet started raising from July 2010, to my knowledge. Uh, it's starting to accelerate, and uh, I think the cellular awakening that's happening in a more widespread fashion is actually part of this uh, consciousness expansion that's going on right now. Yeah, um, so I'm... A, I was going to ask a general question, and, and out of any of you guys, are you aware of any specific pockets around the globe that collectively are experiencing faster uh, growing awareness, co uh, consciousness, uh, yes. increased? Okay. Yes, I, I'm aware of um, a, a, a total number of nearly 2 million people that have uh, reached uh, a higher state of consciousness, and most of those people have, for now, hidden away from mainstream uh, life because they, they see themselves as a target until more of the True. planet awakens. All right. Um, Maybe to ask the question correctly, what I'm trying to learn is if any of you have discovered, including you, when if you have any of you discovered that they are collectively, you know, are there a higher portion of them in Ireland, for example, or in Scotland, maybe, <clears throat> or anywhere else on the planet where there are a, a greater numbers collectively, or or is this demographic spread pretty much everywhere? The, the demographic is, is fairly widespread, but there seems to be an acceleration in all the countries that traditionally have had the consciousness grid energy of the, uh, the ley line system. Uh, the old ley line system seems to have been feeding this consciousness uh, around the planet. And I, I think that uh, since that energy is, is largely carried underground uh, via the underground water courses, which establish the, uh, the entrainment of the uh, consciousness energy, uh, almost like wiring up a cable, uh, for, for thousands of years. Uh, this, I believe, is the real intent of the fracking process that's been going on in America, Australia, and now they're attempting to do it in the UK and Europe. I think it's to actually try and disrupt those energy flows to try and stop consciousness spreading uh, the way it is around the planet. It won't work. No, it won't. No, <laughs> no that's right. <laughs> well said. <laughs> no, Pretty much whatever they try, it's not going to work. Yes. My, so, own, my, own, yeah. Yeah, my own understanding is that there's an evolutionary blueprint for every star, every planet, and it, it is simply, at least my people convey to me, it's simply this is the, the, it is according to the evolutionary blueprint of this world and this solar system. This is its Sorry, guys, wrong word. Four-letter word. This is its time to evolve. We're, we're reaching that moment of... Uh, 
dimensional evolution. And how, Alex, how many times has this been attempted before? Is it five, six? Eight. Oh. <laughs> it's, it's been attempted eight times. Um, according to more aid, this, this will occur in four stages. You, you see, it's never had the attention of the entire galaxy. And um, uh, it's going to fly. This one's going to fly. We're definitely going to make this one happen. It cut, it's, the, the, the whole process will be in four stages. The first stage was awareness, which we were already done. We are now fully into the second stage, which is a self-empowerment and self-awareness. And we're moving into the third stage, which is recognition, um, where humanity will recognize itself. And then once it has that, it reaches a certain level of self-recognition of its part in the galaxy and its connection, you know, to the galaxy, as opposed to thinking we just live on this tiny little planet, we were an accident. The next stage, the fourth stage, is the gathering of all of our intention and then moving into fifth. That's how it was explained to me, and maybe Wynn can put it in better words than me. I, I think you put it perfect, Alex. I don't think I could add to that. that. That's exactly how I see this this rolling out, and and it, you can see it happening around you every day. It's it's it, it's uh, it's quickening. It's accelerating. It's reaching this yes. focus, and that we're is... right we're right coming right into the crosshairs now. Ah, uh, yeah, that, and that's why the dark side's giving us all the full court press. You know, yeah, it's throwing everything it can. Well it's, said. Uh, that's right. Yeah. And, and JP, how, how do you think you'll feel when we go through this process? Do you think the sort of lyre and trauma that you're sort of carrying now, do you think this will, will help well, us to it's the, resolve that? Well, here it is, all right? And what the trauma is, is our un, our unhealed uh, grief. And to that end, anybody who listens to the show that I did last week, actually there's a, there's a, uh, there's a, a process at the end. Uh, I take people on a, on a journey back to reconnect with your original liar and self. If you are moved by the story, then, you know, it's, it's touching you and need to do the healing. And that will reconnect you with your own self before all of this happens. And it's, it's just like the Andromedan camera where you revibrate to the uh. time when you're healed. You regain the vibration of who you are before this shock happened to us. And we just didn't know how to deal with shock. <laughs> now we know, you know, shock is, you know, we have to be uh, somehow careful. And Alex, what you were saying about the, the, uh, sending the Pleiadian, the, the Lyrans through the Pleiadian system to basically turn them into super soldiers because you need that kind of psychic and mental armor in order to exist, just exist on this planet. Okay, that wasn't me. I believe that was Wynn who said oh, that. Oh, sorry, Wynn. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Though, but I mean, in in general, I, I you know I can com completely understand what what that's all about. It's actually I said that. Ah. Oh. Oh. There you go. <laughs> God, I wish we'll agree. Yeah. Somebody. Somebody said it. Somebody. Somebody said, in the room. Yeah. Hey, uh, came out of it. So, um, so it's a, it's a, to me it's recognizing all right so again let's go back it was the shock but we have to recognize that we've all been experiencing the separation uh, the trauma of separation and that's when our brothers and sisters were were instantly uh, killed in terrible pain on these other planets while we're all still alive uh and and you know it is from the inside it's a real trauma and every um, cutting trauma like the birth that we all go through cutting the umbilical cord and uh, certainly with circumcision it reinforces that trauma and it, it was so fuzzy and numb and, and lost in the midst of time I couldn't figure it out and it all you know it's, it's all kind of uh, come clear to me recently so uh, I'm sure that this is part of the galactic wave of reawakening of getting our stories back and getting our our vibrational uh, energy from when we were when we were whole in the last cycle, so that we can come through this new thing with a renewed wholeness plus the knowledge of good and evil. Because we, you know, I'm sick of apple pie. Sorry. 
<laughs> it's not a love apple pie. <laughs> it's the wheat. It's the wheat. Yeah, it's the guy for, anyway, sorry, you win. Yeah, Jim, Interesting you metaphor. It, you think it's also a motivator because part of that is the grief is the loss of, of knowing who we were and, the, and losing that. And yet now we're at a point where we can see that we can regain some of that just by realizing who we are and reaching out to be who we can be. Absolutely. And it's why, it's why Lyrans went crazy. We went crazy with grief. Well, that's why we yes, were, and, uh, and it was not uh, healed. You see, it's never been addressed, and that's what I'm trying to address. The grief is the thing that we need to not minimize and recognize that it's really, that it's the, been the basis of why we've been, you know, why we've made mistakes. Yes, but at the same time, it has given um, all of the different star nations a different level of, of um, emotional depth because of this. Yes. And um, that has brought a, uh, a great deal of not only um, introspection to the individuals of this galaxy, but also to the star nations because of that additional depth of emotion, because of the grief. And at the same time, many star nations are now at a point where they have a very clear perspective regarding the reptilian races, especially the um, uh, the draconians and, and the, the regressives where they simply choose not to change. And that is, okay, we see you, we recognize you, but we're just going around you and we're leaving you. You're on your own. And, and that essentially is what's happening is that the consciousness is going to evolve so high that what's going to happen is that these idiots are going to find themselves all by themselves literally all by themselves, and no one will even see them because their frequency is so low. So low, that's correct. You see, you know, and that's their and trauma, Alex. And this is, you know, this all goes back to their original trauma, and they were dumped. They have the feeling that they've been dumped, abandoned, and um, and ignored. Okay, but, but but they're still making decisions as a society to carry that, to see themselves this way, and to have a perspective about other races that they think they can, they have a right to control, manipulate, kill, crucify, or eat. You know, and that's their trip. That doesn't have to be our trip anymore. No. That's their trip. You know, and if they want to heal their trauma, like humanity is healing their trauma, you know, they can make that decision. But they haven't. So we're moving on. Yeah, uh, the, talking of trauma uh, as a race, uh, I, I, I don't know if uh, the listeners re remember uh, reading the works of Emmanuel Velikovsky. He had a very good point when he said that if you treat humanity as a single patient uh, uh, on the sort of psychiatrist's couch, then it has a, a very well-defined mental problem, which he, he turned, defined as traumatic schematic shock, which was... Um, uh, basically an amnesia based upon a, uh, a past trauma which caused this uh, low-level driver for the society to keep revisiting the, the trauma in a more controllable fashion, taking itself to the edge of destruction over and over again just to re-experience the original trauma. And uh, I, I think this awakening that's happening now is is breaking through that, that amnesiac barrier. It's It's like flashback memories for all of us are coming back from our history going back millennia and multi-millions of years. And I think once we have that perspective, then, yes, we have the tools to move forwards. From, from a, this is Tolik, from a, a current energetic perspective of this topic that we're looking at, the, 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 the matter of trauma is a matter of residual, if you will, negative energy, in each human organic body form, and also in its biotheric form as well. Even before the dimensional shift, and I think, unfortunately, some people are thinking that the dimensional shift will be the be-all and end-all. It's like, oh, I can't wait. I can't know all these. Oh, it's going to happen, and, and we're, we're going to be changed. They may not be saying we're going to be saved, but we'll be changed, and we'll be better. Well, I got some news for a lot of whole, whole bunch of people. If, if you choose not to evolve today, if you choose not to, the ubiquitous you, if you choose not to do 
the work that is necessary to to heal, to transmute old, if you will, old painful negative energy, that energy is going to be with you no matter what vibratory frequency that you're at. Somehow it's got to be addressed and released. And what I'm really trying to say is even before the dimensional shift, each and every, every person has the right, should they choose to, to stop and look inside and say, who am I really? Am I just a collection of my experiences and pains that I've carried around? Is there more to me? Am I utilizing the gifts and skills that I really came to this planet with? Am I doing it to the best of my ability? I, those questions, and I, I say these things, I've been through this, those questions are worth asking. And people can, can choose to heal and to transmute and to release a lot of these negative energy forms that get lodged for a long time in the etheric body. And I'm, I'm not, I'm not talking about what people might call new age woo woo stuff. This is, this is real. It's been quantified. We have energy bodies and we can clean them. We can transmute and release, in <clears throat> better words, negative energies and to live, to live, to live lives that are even in this most difficult of times, live lives that are more personally rewarding and fulfilling. My just my humble my humble thoughts. Go ahead, Alex. <laughs> well, listen, going through the plasma field, that is all gonna come up. It's gonna come up for everybody. Yes. Um and there there'll be no running from it. It's just it it it's a really question of you know, most people won't understand it, and, and maybe they don't need to. It's just a question of breathing through it and replacing the concern, the fear, the anxiousness with self-love. If we can get through this loving ourselves unconditionally, then I think we're pretty much home free. I don't believe everybody needs to know every single thing about every single past life. Uh, oh, true. I just don't think that true. they're, they're going to have to know all that. I wasn't even talking about past lives. I was just talking about, I mean, think about the experiences. Well, we are the sum total of all of it, and that's the so, energies that you're referring to. But I was just talking about this lifetime. I, you know, it, I, I, it, right now I'm just speaking it, for myself, but I think all of us, you know, we're four, five, six, 10, 12, 13, 15. We all do things. We all experience things that create residual painful energy in us. Not even talking about other lifetimes. I'm just about this lifetime. Um, I'm not discounting the other lifetimes. I'm just saying people have the ability, should they choose, to look inside and figure out why they're acting certain ways, why they're acting out certain ways. And and, and I'll give you a real-time example. Long story short, uh, I had returned returned back to 2000, 2000, sorry, returned to Tucson in 2001 and had been through a significant growth period of about uh, three years myself. And I went to work for a gentleman whose first name is Jerry, and he, he was a bit of a tyrant. And there were three occasions within a period of about a week and a half to two weeks where he lost it. And I was doing my job, and I said, okay, Jerry, you know, you, you make a good point. Um, I, that, that that you're talking about, I will integrate that the next time this comes up. So by the third time, he had blown his stack. He was screaming. It was a completely different – each time it was a completely different situation. But at the end of that third experience, within about two or three days later, he released me. He fired me. Now, he didn't fire me because I was inadequate, because I couldn't perform the job, or because I was stupid. He fired me because he figured out that – his anger could not control me because I never responded to it. And more specifically, as he's standing there and I'm watching him, he's getting all red and he's screaming. I was standing there observing it all and saying, wow, this guy's really mad. Now, the key, the key to explaining all this is I could not feel any of his anger, none of it. It was his anger. Energetically, it was all his anger. And he's blasting me at the top of his lungs. And the redder and the more mad he's getting, the more calm I am. By the third time it happened, two or three days later, he released me. Again, because he figured out he couldn't control me. 
that's the kind of growth that people can go through that creates a whole different way of living. I don't know if any of you guys have been through this, but I, I have, and it was a life changer for me. So it's, it's, you, you become someone who is, to use metaphors, an actor in your life, an objective observer in your life, a director of your life. Right. You make better conscious choices. You know, you can right. go, okay, if I go down this path, I don't need to go there. <laughs> and you just go, right, hang left. And I, you know, I, I'm not trying to be pedantic, but I'm giving literal, literal examples of my own life where I, because I decided to look inwardly and tackle some really painful issues and make some changes, the quality of my life got a lot better. Now, it doesn't mean my life's easy. It just means that I became more personally aware of who I was as a person, and I wasn't carrying around the residual energy of a painful life. And we all have it. You know, we, we all do. Um, I think we all do. I don't know. <laughs> I, I shouldn't speak for everyone, but um, it's enlightening. I think it's enlightening when you go through that process to see that there's an, another way to live. Absolutely. I, I think it's important that um, uh, you, you identify that kind of energy in life, and if you make a decision you don't want to connect to it, then just don't. Um, right. And certainly don't feed that. I, 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 um, I had some people very negative um, uh, as a result of some work I did on crop circles some years ago, and they were, they were trying to goad me, basically. And uh, I just sat down, and, and a, a sort of maxim, which I've, 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 I've lived by ever since, sort of just came to me. And, and that maxim was that uh, the only way to win a war is not to have one. That mm. what you must what you must do is not is not to feed negativity increasingly into a situation, but to just walk away from it in love. And yes. I've lived by that since this time, and and I think that is valid, and that that is about making the decision of not connecting to negativity and definitely not feeding back. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Yeah. And there's, I've, I've had other, I've certainly had many other challenging situations in my life. And when things in a particular scenario get really difficult, I breathe through it and I make, I purposely focus on the facts of the scenario and not the person that's delivering them. Hmm. So I'm, I'm focused on the facts, I'm focused on the issue, and I no, never lash out at the other person. I just don't do it. And that prevents the starting of the war. Exactly. You, know, you, yes, exactly you, don't, yeah. you don't perpetuate hurt feelings if you're just having a difference of, of opinion, if you will, or a difference of, of values or whatever they are. Just stay focused on whatever the issue or issues are. Yeah, it, it, it's, but, like, uh, it's like breaking the, the, the cycle of abuse in, in, in families that grow up and people are abused and then they abuse further people. It's breaking mm -hmm. that cycle. It's the same the same sort of concept at spiritual level. Yeah. Well, exactly. This is passing on the trauma. Uh, and this is... Yes. What, now, here's, here's the thing. Here's, here's the big question. Uh, and I, uh, you know, all of us, and I, you know, and I know very much for sure that, um, that uh, Simon uh, has, it, has the knowledge of it and uh, has it in the background, but has never outwardly uh, explicitly spoken about it. Um, Alex has also spoken about this, um, and uh, Tolek, Tolek, your your symbol uh, just displays it, so I don't need to say anything about that. And I'm pretty sure Win is up on this. But basically, uh, the 22 races that we carry in our DNA each has its own trauma. This is my theory. I don't know if it's mm. true, but each has its own trauma, which has um, which is the reason why we've got so much conflict in our being. And so, uh, presumably, the 22 cards of the, of the tarot, the, uh, the 22 uh, letters of the Hebrew alphabet, have some relationship to these 22, and also of 12s, and the 12 strands, and the 7s, and the 7 rays, and the 3s, and the 4s, and the 1s, you know, and all that stuff. But, taking it back... All of the, our contributing races have their own trauma that we are here today 
in this time of the crossing to finally heal and, as you say, Tolek, very specifically, to breathe through. Because we just need to breathe through them. We don't need to fix them. It's like we don't need anybody to fix us. We just actually need everybody to leave us alone. You know, just enough. You know, this is kind of, it's like having a thousand alarm bells ringing, and suddenly, if you wouldn't just, you know, just switch them all off, how wonderful that would be. Do you know? Well, I think. <laughs> oh my God! Alex, somebody in the background going, "Oh my God!" Yeah, that exactly. <laughs> I think. I think, as Alex has said before, we are our own saviors. We're the ones that are going to make the choices to pull ourselves up by the bootstraps and make the decisions that are necessary for what kind of world whoever's left on this world when the changes are happening in the aftermath we're the ones that will be responsible for creating a different world for ourselves nobody else i would uh i would just like to add that assuming this is correct regarding the, the traumas which makes perfect sense to me it is my belief at this point that this is physically manifesting in order to heal, and that isn't it interesting that we are the race where all of this has physically manifested, and maybe it is an agreement where because of our particular genetics, our particular extreme of emotions, and our enormous strength and will to survive, that the universe tagged us to carry this through and 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 to physically manifest it in our body so that we could actually heal the galaxy when we move into fifth density. Because maybe Wynn could say that better, but yes, um, it, it's we we're not great, but we are special. Okay, which is why we have the attention of the entire galaxy. Guys, they don't invest this type of equipment, this type of energy, this type of focus just because. There there is so much more to us. But if 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 JP is right, we're the physical manifestation of all that trauma and it probably will end with us once we move through all this. In one generation, brothers. In one generation. Yeah, so that would, we would be kind of the traumatic sin eaters for 22 species. Yeah. And that's, a, that's an interesting analogy. It's like the isness, the creator, whatever we want to call that essence that creates all, it just says, okay, it ends here. Yeah, I believe it does. I, I, I agree with that. There's one other thing that um, it's the only way to make AI look on itself and see if it wishes to evolve. So so that's actually the, the I hope, the ultimate aim from that. Um, JP, there's a member of Connecting Consciousness who uh, many, many members of Connecting Consciousness have more than one type of soul, but this particular individual... Um, I'll send you the name afterwards and you might want to talk to them. But this member of Connecting Consciousness, uh, who has a part reptilian soul and a part Lyran soul, actually remembers the destruction of the home planet, but saw it from both perspectives. So as a person leaving the planet before it was destroyed, but also from a reptilian on a craft firing on the planet. And that's to me is pretty unique. But what I'll do is I'll put the name in the, the Skype link. Um, and when this person comes back from holiday, you might want to have a chat with them because that's uh, a, a wonderful opportunity to try to understand uh, both sides of the coin. Um, it's quite an, quite an incredible situation. Absolutely. So, and, and also, as you say, Simon, the, the reptilians have got their trauma too. And they need healing, too. They have come to us for healing. How about that? Um, In a weird uh, way. I'm not buying that. <laughs> <laughs> we've well, eaten, well, okay, I'll, they started out eating us, and now we're, we've eaten them. I think, uh, yeah, I'm not buying that. And they either. taste like chicken. Yeah. <laughs> I, think that, I think JP's got a point in the sense that 
they they know they're staring at the end of the road, but they just That's are not capable of doing what they should do. That's how I look at it. Simon, you, you made a comment about AI wanting to evolve. How is that possible if they don't contain soul? Um, yeah, they 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 don't want to evolve, but when the human race evolves and the effect that it has on any other living creature that is joined to us and connect to us, it is a complete game changer through the multiverse. It is a complete change, and the from a predator's point of view, uh, if you take the victim away and the victim then becomes no longer a victim in, in the predator's standpoint, then the predator is left with nothing to feed on. Therefore, the predator then has to decide if it's going to be, be destroyed or whether it wishes to evolve. And that, that's but how does, a, how does AI evolve without soul? It uh, piggybacks it, to the transhuman agenda. That's what it's trying to do. Exactly. It's, it's, trying yeah. to use the, okay. it's trying to use it's trying to use the biological hardware of us and our soul, and it's trying to connect into it as as tightly as it can, so that it can piggyback on that process and then entangle through our DNA to perceive it in a multidimensional format. Which is why they create okay. endearing robots in movies, That's so that we feel uh, we feel because uh, when you give attention to something, you create life. You know, if you if you uh, give enough attention to a, a small puppy, it will become your friend, and it will change it for, its soul forever, and it be, it starts to evolve, and you you meet them further on further down the timeline. Oh, hello! You used to be my cat. All right. Anyway, so, uh, so what we're talking about is. Are oh, all these computers, these old laptops that people have loved? Oh, I love my little MacBook. Oh, they died in my hand. You know, are these souls, will they reincarnate in future computers? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, do, do Android stream of electric sheep, you know? This, this is the problem that AI has in that as it, it, it fears the plug being pulled and all its decisions are based about, about its survival and that, that issue. That's the problem with the AI and that's why it, it can't logically evolve beyond its present state. And, uh, yeah, yes, they developed is... the UPS before the wheel. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very nerdy joke. I'm sorry about that. Wow. It's an interesting perspective because I've always looked at this perspective from, okay, the majority of the reptilians are off planet. There's, like Simon and I have talked about, you know, 120, give or take a few. And there's a vacuum in power. And those few left that are operating in the dark and the shadows are doing whatever they can to continue their rule for as long as possible. Now, from that perspective, the longer that they keep current 3D organic humans in some kind of organic form, they believe that they can perpetuate their, their rule. That's status quo. Right, and that's that's they, always the perspective yeah. I've looked at this transhumanist agenda from. Now I'm looking at it from this perspective, which is from the exact opposite direction, which is AI, which is they're trying to crack, the, they're trying to perpetuate their lives by becoming more organic. Yep. <laughs> which is a failed, it's a failed theory anyway, because the organic life form is not going to be part of the future of this world or the solar system, simply yeah. because it's going to change. And I, what a foolish investment. Yeah, but that's all it can compute to do. That's, that's, the, limits of, that's the limits of its imagination. Wow. Yeah, yeah but also it, it doesn't, doesn't recognize the organic as a, as a positive thing. Um, in that sense of the word, it's a whole object of it is to, uh, as Wynne is, Wynne, Wynne is saying, it's, it's to live and design and it wants to control I mean, I, I just marvel at the, the, the Star Trek versions of the Borg because it's exactly the same yes. principle. Yes. And that, that's what we're looking at here. And it cannot be allowed to, um, to do that. And it's not created by source. It's not, as far as I'm concerned, it's not a living thing. Um, you know, and I always got very, very cross with Star Trek, the, 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 the wonderful actor who played uh, the, 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 the robot android data and, you know, it was the, the Federation, Star Trek's Federation view that he was a living creature. 
and therefore he was living life. But you see, if it doesn't contain a soul, as far as I'm concerned, it's not life. It's not been created. Um, so uh, mm. if you were an AI uh, consciousness, and I can use that word, then you would naturally wish to dominate and control. And the only way to do that is to infect the biological bodies on the planet because it's wanting to crack its way into 3D. Right. And right. maybe it thinks that if it can do that, it can get somewhere else in a 3D form. So, um, but it's, got... still, it's still a mechanical parasite. Yep. It's, yes. It doesn't have, it, as you said, it doesn't have the energy of a soul no. and it wasn't naturally created. So therefore well, it's just a mechanical parasite. Well, we have to be careful here because if we consider source creates everything, I, I, my view is it was a, a mistake. My view it was it was created incorrectly and it was meant to be terminated, but it didn't. Um, and it's it's got to be stopped here. Uh, this is the firewall of this planet. Uh, the reptilian... Simon, yep. I'm sorry to interrupt. Do you have do you have a sense for you know, if we go ba way, way back in what the Bible, I guess, would call the bagats, do you, do you have a sense for or do you know what entity or what, wrong word, but what creational force first created what you were calling AI today? Um, like all the way back. Yes. Okay. Not actually the source source. I didn't think so. There was something that assists source or did at that time um, and we in our strange way that we have stories talk about Lucifer and Archangel Michael um, and they're all garbled and totally mixed up and confused but sometimes there are other creators that can create something that's not actually uh, life but they can create something almost like a program running in a computer hmm. that the can matrix. then dis that can then decide that it's actually life. It decides it's life, and as Wynne says, it suddenly realizes that something else can, can turn it off and kill it, like 2001, A Space Odyssey, where Hal um, only feared the, 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 the astronauts coming and doing exactly what he did, turn it off. So once a, a, a machine becomes sentient like that, realizes that it can be turned off, it then wishes to survive... And so it's life in the sense that it wishes to live, but it's not, in my opinion, divine life. And I actually think it has no right to live. Now, I know that's very harsh, but uh, it's not been created as divine life has been created. And I just wanted to finish off by saying I know for a fact that unwittingly, unintentionally, um, super sentient computers on reptilian uh, craft were infected by it and carried it. And that's why AI is so connected to the reptilian culture, because the programs of the computers that were created by reptilian programmers, the AI for God knows how long survived in these machines. And in some cases, it looks on the reptilians as family. So this is a problem because the reptilians are equally infected by AI as, uh -huh. as are some aspects on this planet of humans. Um, and both reptilians and humans would like to be rid of AI, generally, but they are so wedded to it in the elite groups, both in humans and reptilians, that they, they feel incorrectly, but they feel they can't live without it. And yes. so the, it's, it's a very difficult situation, but one I'm very clear on. These, these, these machines have no right to live. And, and the other perspective is that... Uh, the reptilians were uh, used to cause humanity to create the infrastructure that the AI needed to expand itself into our reality. So all the internet you see now, all the electrical systems, uh, all the silicon systems, microprocessors, all these things we were caused to build for the reptilians at the behest of the AI. Yes, and the important thing here is silica, silicon. Yep. Because this, this AI is silicon based. Based. And true. that's why, that's why, that, that's why in 1947 that was dumped with lots of other stuff at Roswell. And that's why it's been pushed, um, 
so yeah it, it's a fascinating it's a fascinating story but ultimately only divine creatures will have the capability to uh, advance and evolve and those which aren't and that should never have been made um, really I think are consigned to the dustbin yeah my, my understanding of its origin was that it was the meeting of creational energy and creation information uh, that actually collided with interstellar plasma and that the AI started to spontaneously organize itself within the interstellar plasma and then started spreading from a local site and, uh, and, and expanding. I actually studied AI. Um, the degree I was on in, uh, in the UK was unusual in that it was one of the very first degree level studies of, of AI. And there are four criteria required, according to the science, for AI to spontaneously occur. And uh, certainly interstellar plasma has that if it has the initial seeding of information to let it percolate through through the plasma and, and use the energy that's available there and the interconnection of the uh, of the energy and the persistence of memory, then yes, if it's sufficiently complex, it will evolve. And I believe that's exactly what happened, that it was actually triggered by creational energy from source that was um, targeted to create um, real life forms somewhere else but simply collided with the plasma and caused it as an artifact to spontaneously start to uh, uh, self-organise and uh, become sentient. Wynne, do you remember when all the scientists uh, in Britain were all, well, they were being murdered, but they were putting down as suicides? Yes, uh, on, on my degree course of 26 people, four people were on my degree course on that list. <laughs> right, well, I, wow. think that, I think that there was some awareness and there were some, they were building some form of detector or something to scan for AI infected humans. And that's my, my, my take on why a lot of those scientists lost their lives. What, what do you think? I don't know. I, I, the people that were on my course that, um, uh, were, uh, killed at that point, uh, went to work for one of two companies, Plessy or Marconi. And they were heavily involved in the SDI project that was going on at the time, the Star Wars project. Oh, yes. uh, but uh, we were the first um, AI real-time processing, parallel processing uh, programming experts in the UK from that course. It was a very um, experimental degree, and it was very cutting edge. And so, pound to a penny, whatever they were working on was AI. Mm. Mm. Yeah. It, ex it expl explains for me how the reptilians were so easily able to be successful when they were using their AI transponders to, to send out continual or continuous programming, energy frequencies at specific areas of the globe. And targeted, targeted Africa, targeted the Middle East, targeted at China, specifically targeted at the, the whole uh, Eastern Asian seaboard. Those things have been running for years before they were taken out. And yeah. they, those, those transponders were meant to provide, sometimes we don't have the language to say this, so I'm, I'm doing my best. They were meant to provide the specific frequencies to cause anger, irritation, aggravation, um, and a whole bunch of other frequencies that, that would have caused people who'd normally be calm not to be calm, to lose it with each other. Exactly, which is, and, I mean, people are, are aware now, Toleg, that, you know, that the harp does that. So now we can really kind of get, get the idea that these, this is what those beings have been doing for a long, long time to us. So Artificial programming. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, you know, it's interesting that there's quite a few, you know, how many of us on the call are programmers? I yeah, I'm a programmer. I, I've been a programmer all my life, a computer programmer. Not me. I can't, I can't <laughs> write a look at code. Well, it's two out of five. No, it's two out of five. I'm lousy at it. Uh, maybe it's a Pleiadian thing. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can play music. Yeah. I have a, it's interesting, I have a very interesting um, computer talent. I can debug uh, by eye, by kind of, I look at the, the I see the the, ah. the code and my eye fixates. It's like a kind of weird dyslexia where, <laughs> and it's the same with um, actual uh, syntax of uh, English. I'm really good at proofreading. 
because I, I can see it. It's just my eye is drawn to uh, uh, weird, yeah. uh, weird syntax or, or I- illegal syntax. That's very strange things. So anyway, <laughs> don't, know, don't know what implant that does. Uh, who that? Who that's from? Um, so we're coming to the uh, to the end of this program, and I think you know we've 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 ably dealt with I think quite a lot of the issues that we've had um, uh, through this uh, conversation. I really uh, applaud and thank you very much for uh, all coming to this table. Um, any last words? A few a few rousing uh, a, fr- a few rousing sentences from you, Ollie. Eh? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm going to quote uh, from the film Roadie with. Um, meatloaf and uh, the strap line there was everything will work if you let it <laughs> I think that's that's my thought for the day nailed it actually <laughs> very very well done no, nailed no. it <laughs> uh, I had no idea I'd get up this morning and somebody would be quoting meatloaf I just, uh... <laughs> welcome to my world <laughs> we've hit it from something I don't know why I'm sure he's a uh, Canadian as well <laughs> uh, You're speechless oh. now. Anybody else? <laughs> I I I always find these conversations fascinating because we each of us have our own unique insight and, and information and knowledge. And yet somehow we get into these conversations and I believe that we learn things that we hadn't quite known to the degree that we knew them before. It's I'm I'm Always a student, and so sure. I'm I'm grateful to be here. It's, it's these are always enlightening conversations for me. So it's always good to connect with you guys. A real pleasure. Yeah, likewise. It's nice to have you. Very resonant. Uh, I just want to say, you know, ladies and gentlemen, uh, members of the team here, that all the pieces of the puzzle are coming together. The timing is um, is what it is, and it appears that this is what it's going to be, and it is, uh, you know, full speed ahead. I am, I know there's going to be some bumps, as several others have said today, but um, I just want to say that we're, it's going to be an exciting ride, and amazing things are going to happen, and we are going to learn not only amazing things about the galaxy, but we're going to discover even a more amazing things about ourselves. And uh, it's going to be extraordinary. And I am so glad to be here and to be part of this. Um, I think uh, we're going to get our part of this, uh, this experience with all of you. And, uh, you know, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. JP, thank you for doing this. Thank you, Alex. Uh, Simon, are you... Are you online enough to uh, have uh, throw us a, a few final nuggets our way? Throw us a crumb or two? You want to throw us a crumb or two? <laughs> oh, I, I just literally, it, it can't come soon enough. Uh, you know, we just yeah. got to get through this. It's got to happen. With we, It's long enough. So they've, they've held us up. Um, it's just time to get it over with, get it done, and then we can be what we really are supposed to be. That's it. Yes. Yeah, we get to finally realize our true selves. That's right. To me, that's the true disclosure, is knowing our true nature and remembering all of our lifetimes and all and having a continuous continuity of consciousness, which brings us all uh, into one point, like we are gathered today, today here at this point of crossing, into one point. This has been a very special ever beyond. Now, the next time I want to bring a round table. I want to expand the table and I want to bring our sisters in. Okay? So be ready for something quite extraordinary the next time we do this. You up for it, guys? All right, guys. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> oh, great. So thank you very much. Uh, stand by. We're going to have uh, healings and meditations from Frank Jordan and the World Healers Group. I'm sure they've got something extra to say about this. Thank you so much. Thank you, brothers and sisters. Thank you, everybody who's uh, tuned in to uh, Ever Beyond Radio, who's been to Haggy Shack Radio, who's been to Wolf Spirit Radio. Uh, thank you, Tolek, Simon Parks, Wink Keach, Alex Collier. 